Welcome to University Heights this morning on a beautiful Labor Day weekend. I hope you're having uh, a lot of fun this weekend and are looking forward to a day off tomorrow. We're excited to be here today. We're excited to get to worship with you. We're excited to make some music together. Would you stand, please, and let's begin with song. Holy, 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 holy,
Morning, church. All right. Hope that you're all doing well this morning, whether you're here in person or joining us online. We're really thankful that you're worshiping with us today. If you are a guest with us, we would love for you to take that uh, connection card that should be somewhere near you and fill that out, and you can put that in the offering plate a little bit later this morning when that comes around. We're thankful to be able to gather together to lift high the name of Jesus today. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes and pray with me? Lord, indeed, we are thankful to gather in this place, to gather together, to gather uh, at home as we watch and as we worship together. God, we know that in this day and age, during this pandemic, we are together and yet we are separated in so many ways. Lord, we pray that as we worship this morning, as we pray together and as we sing together, as we open scripture together, that we, would, that we would know that your presence is with us, that your presence would encourage us, that your presence would challenge us, that your presence would teach us and call us to be more and more like Christ. Help us, God, to worship you in spirit and in truth today and to lift high the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray, amen. A head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. The Savior knelt to wash our feet. Now at his feet we bow. The one who wore our sin and shame, now robed in majesty, the radiance of perfect love, now shines for all to Thank you. 
the tomb where soldiers watched in vain was borrowed for three days his body there would not remain our god has robbed the grave our god has robbed the I have a couple of topics to talk to you about this morning. September is our month to, for our church to be responsible for bringing food to supply the Grand Oak Mission, which is sponsored by the Green County Baptist Association. They need staples of all kinds, but specifically at this time, they can use canned fruits or crackers or peanut butter and jelly and canned SpaghettiOs. They give out packages of spaghetti and spaghetti mix, but for a one person, the SpaghettiOs in cans are much more practical. If you would prefer, you can give cash rather than shopping for groceries, because David, who runs the, the mission, has ways to buy butter and chicken and ground beef at a much reduced price. So if you'd just like to contribute some cash, you can either put it in an envelope and put it in the offering, or Leave it in the office so it's designated what it's for. September is also the month that we have a an emphasis on regional and associational missions. Our offering for this will be divided between the uh, ABC Great Rivers region and the CBF Heartland and the Green County Baptist Association. The offering that's given to the Green County Baptist Association during this time will be used for a number of special projects, not just their regular budget. They have projects like Mexican missions, pastors, retreats, the Springfield Prayer Breakfast, the BSU, and support for ethnic churches in Springfield. There are special envelopes in the pew racks, if you'd like to use those, or there are uh, envelopes in your uh, in offering envelope packets. Our goal this month is $4,000, so let's be generous. Would you join me in prayer, please? Our Father in heaven, we come to you with grateful hearts for all the blessings that you so generously bestow upon us. We know you are all powerful and can do anything to accomplish your purposes in this world, but we also know that you want us to join you in your missions. Please help us to give joyfully to help others, to hear about your love for them. Jesus taught us to help our neighbors, and this offering opportunity is one way we can do that. We want to be your hands and feet and heart on the corner of Grand and National in Springfield, Missouri. I pray this in your blessed name, son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we prepare to offer our tithes and offerings, would you stand please and let's sing a hymn together.
It is time for the children's message this morning. If you're a child and want to be a part of the children's message, come on down and let's have a children's message. Hello. How goes it? Pretty good? Not too shabby? Hmm. What do I got here? 
rocks. Not just any type of rocks, but a big old bucket of rocks. It's kind of heavy. Oh. When you look at that bucket of rocks, what does it make you think of? What do you see? What comes to your mind when you see a large bucket of rocks? Different colors, love. Some might be smooth. Different shapes, love it. There might be fossils in there, you never know. You just never know. When Miss Abby sees a big old bucket of rocks, though, you know what it makes me think of? Work. You know, back in the day, when Miss Abby was a wee little lass, um, I spent almost all my summers with my grandparents, mainly because they lived next door. And so we all lived on this little area of land where my grandpa had cows when I was younger, and then our backyard was his farm of garden goodies. And so one day, I had the bright idea to admit to my papa that I was bored. You ever said that? You ever said you're bored? Yeah? What typically is the response when you tell a grandparent or a parent, hey, I'm, I'm bored. This is so boring. I'm bored. What's their response? You don't know? Have you ever said you're bored? Trust me, I, I've been around you long enough. You've told me you're bored before. Like, yes, you can be bored before. Yes, okay. What do they tell you? Find something to do? Suck it up, buttercup? Yeah. Go find something to work on. <laughs> well, how splendid. Um, I only have ever said one time when I was of the age of eight that I was bored. And I never said it again. You want to know why? You want to know why? <sighs> and you know, when you harvest in a garden, there's a thing called the tiller, tills, I think. Yeah. You know, a tiller, what can it not do? It has to till. Well, you got me, Izzy. What is it? <laughs> it can't till rocks. So what that means is whenever I said I was bored, Papa said, okay, sissy babe, go ahead and grab that bucket and go in the garden and pick rocks. Miss Abby did a lot of work. It was hot. It was dirty. It was yucky. I had grasshoppers hopping all over me. My nails had, nail beds had dirt all in them. And you could hear my grandma from the porch, now, shock, that's too much. Don't make her do any more. Don't keep making her work. Well, she said she was bored. So I went and took my bucket, my grand, it was only like for maybe five minutes because, you know, but it felt like an eternity, eternity. I went and took my bucket and I picked up rocks, good job, good job, good job. And it wasn't like it was a cool day, you know what I mean? It was like the hottest day of the year. It was just like, let's just go outside and sweat. This represents work to me. And did you know, when you walk through the produce aisle of Walmart or you go through your grocery store and you see produce, did you know a lot of people see yummy, delicious fruits and vegetables. Which they should, right? Did you know some people see those things and they think, work? Do they magically get there? Do they magically just poof from the produce fairy and plop into the ba baskets of Walmart? No. It takes work to get them there. Somebody has to grow them. Somebody has to take care of them and harvest them. Somebody has to drive them in a truck to get them where they need to go. Somebody has to have a job to lay them out gently, not throw them. Have you always had like bruised peaches? I hate that. Anyway, you have to get your produce and different things and put them in the buckets. Work is attached to things sometimes. And God knows this. And you know what God said specifically? Tomorrow is Labor Day. And he says specifically... In Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. God put Adam in the Garden of Eden to work. That's what he did. God made all of us to work, and some of us work in different ways. Some of us might work at home. We might work at a, at a different um, location. We might work um, remotely or in different locations instead of just one building. You all work at school. But the gift of Labor Day is to acknowledge that, yes, God gives us work and to do it well, 
and to not complain about <laughs> the work that we do. But he gives us days of rest. Every Sunday should be a day of rest, but we get extra lucky and get another day tomorrow. <laughs> and so as you're relaxing and not being at school tomorrow, remember that people work really hard, and God has given us what's called a work ethic. It's how we work. Do we have a good work ethic, meaning we're a good worker, or do we have a bad work ethic, and we're just like, meh, whatever. God calls us to be good workers, and as we go throughout our week, help us to remember that we are called to be good workers, even if our work is schoolwork, and we don't want to do it all the time, okay? Let's pray, and we're going to head upstairs to Children's Church. Father God, I come to you now, and I thank you for giving us life lessons for us to connect to, um, to point those back to who you are and how much you love us. Help us to be thankful for work, even though it is hard. It can be tiresome. It can even be hurtful to our soul sometimes. But God, you restore us, and you give us um, new hope each day. Your mercies are new every day, which is a promise from you. Help us to remember that as we continue. Enjoy our day of rest, and help us to live um, pointing others to you and how we work and how we treat others. In your name, amen. Let's stand again and sing once more together.
Um, as you can tell, we got our new headset mic in, which I am very excited about. I am no longer constrained by the wood. I can move around. Thankful for that. Um, this week, we are uh, doing a standalone series. We finished up our short All In series last week, and uh, next week, we're going to have uh, our long-awaited installation service, which we are excited about, um, and uh, we've waited a long time for that. Obviously, it seems a little bit strange to welcome a new pastor and family 18 months after the new pastor and family get there, uh, but it's still an important time for the church uh, to say thanks to God for what he has done, and that's a uh, a, a rare occasion in any church, but especially this church, in 76 years of University Heights Baptist Church, I'm the seventh pastor, and so there haven't been very many pastors at University Heights Baptist Church, so there haven't been very many installation services, and so we'll do that next week, and I'm looking forward to that. My One of my mentors and one of my friends, Dr. Larry Baker, will be here from Kansas City, where he and his wife Wanda live now, and he'll be preaching next week, and I'm excited uh, for them to be here. Um, we also will have a reception that afternoon at 3 o'clock in the fellowship hall where we'll have folks uh, from the community come and bring greetings, um, and that'll be pretty much uh, normal. We decided not to have food for that because of just the ongoing pandemic. Um, I think we all know that we're still dealing with that. In fact, um, we had two kids tested yesterday because we're still dealing with that. They're tested negative, thankfully, or I wouldn't be here today, by the way, um, but, uh, but they're fine, just a little bit of a cold. So we want to be as careful as we can, but I'm looking forward to next week and for, um, for, uh, for, that special, for that special day. If you have your Bible with you this morning, I'd like you to turn that to Matthew chapter 11. Our verse for today, or our passage for today, is very short, just three verses. Three verses that are really powerful and meet us exactly, I think, where we're at, especially as we think about Labor Day and as we think about work and as we think about life and as we think about the rhythm of life and work and rest and, and Sabbath. This comes at the very end of chapter 11, and Jesus says, Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is the word of God for the people of God. I never imagined in my life, when I was in seminary and even in ministry, that I would ever serve as a hospice chaplain. And yet, as we sometimes say, God moves in our lives and works in our lives in strange ways, in ways we never, uh, in ways we never think He might. And I grew to love it. I wasn't so sure at first. You know how you've probably had a job before or a place of employment, and you think those first few weeks or you think those first few months, and you think, I don't, ah, I don't know if this is really for me or not. But then as you're there and as you get invested in it and as you learn the ins and outs, you begin to love it, and I did too. And as I was with people as they walked through life and through the end of life and then to death, they would say things like, I'm worn out, or I'm tired, or I'm ready to go, or I need to go. I remember one person specifically, just before they took their very last breath, said to me, I'm ready to cross the river and rest under the pecan trees. Wow. There's no doubt that in life, and especially at the end of our life, we look towards the rest that we find in eternity with Jesus. But we know that in life we need rest too. Rest isn't just about the end of life. In fact, if rest is just about the end of life for us, then the end of life is probably going to come pretty quick for us. <laughs> we know what it's like to be worn down. We know what it's like to be beat down. We know what it's like to feel overstretched and to have said yes to, to too much. Sometimes at the end of a week, my wife Lisa and I have a conversation about what we're going to do that weekend, and sometimes we end with the phrase, something like this, can we just have a weekend where we do nothing? That sounds great. 
We can get there very easily where we need rest. You notice I have two different shoes on this morning. Maybe you noticed that. Maybe you heard me coming down the hall from like 300 yards away. I'm not sneaking up on anybody. But I have this boot on. I hurt my, the ligaments and the tendon connecting my foot to my big toe about three weeks ago lifting weights. And I gave it about three days rest. And I said, you know what? That's probably good. It feels a little bit better. I'll just go ahead and do the same stuff again. And I did it again. And the next day my foot was ginormous and huge and swollen and now it feels a lot better it doesn't hurt at all but they tell me that I've got to wear this thing or it's not going to get any better so I'm wearing the stupid thing I've got it on but my foot and the way that God created uh, our bodies my foot was telling my brain hey idiot you need to rest and I didn't rest and so it told me louder hey idiot you really need to give it a rest until it made me give it a rest If you're like me, you probably have no problem at all with work ethic, with getting after it, with working hard, but you may struggle to find any other rhythm besides work. You may struggle to find something else there. You may struggle to find that place of rest. Jesus said in the passage we just read, come to me all of you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And sometimes like this week, I read this passage And I think, Jesus, what in the world am I doing wrong here? What what am I messing up? Because things often don't feel very light. And, and, And the burden often doesn't feel very easy. Have you ever felt that way before? Like things aren't as light as we think they should be. Or that the burden doesn't seem as easy as we hope it might be. It's like the feeling you get when you come back from vacation have you been here before you come back from vacation and you're so exhausted you think i need another vacation from my vacation i'm just as tired if not more tired now than when i left to go on vacation because you got zero rest and zero refreshment on vacation and that's only getting worse in the world that we live in and in the economy that we live in we live in what economists now call a hustle economy and so there used to be a day and an age where the vast majority of people had one job and they went to that one job and then they went about the rest of their life after they were done at work that day and now people often have that one primary job but then they also often have one or two other jobs part-time jobs or or side hustles and sometimes sometimes that's necessary and it's becoming more necessary for some people just to make ends meet to do that but for others It's just about having more and and wanting more. And we need to be careful about what we say yes to, about what we agree to, because as we've said before, as I've said before anyway, we can only say yes to so much, and then we're saying no to something else. And then we add the busy life on top of that. We add the extracurricular activities that that kids are involved in. We add uh, travel stuff. We add uh, hobbies And none of those things are inherently bad. None of those things are evil. None of those things are sinful. But you add all that together and it can get to be way too much. And we get beat down. And we go nonstop pedal to the metal. And when we go nonstop pedal to the metal, something is going to pay the price for that. Something is going to pay the price for that. And it's usually our family or our own spiritual health and our relationship with God, or our involvement in the life of the church and serving God in and through the church. And sometimes, sometimes church isn't isn't easy either when we throw that on top of everything else. I tell Lisa all the time, Lionel Richie and the Commodores had no idea what they were talking about when they sang Easy Like Sunday Morning. Lionel Richie never had to get three or four kids ready for church on Sunday morning. It's not easy. I know it's not easy. And so we have this busy life and we throw church life into that and we have all these choices and all this stuff going on, all these things going on in our lives. How in the world 
how in the world do we sort through all of that? And who pays the price for that? What pays the price for all of that over uh, busyness? You know, a year and a half ago, COVID made us stop, right? We didn't have a choice. We had no choice. It wasn't just like, uh, you know what, I'm going to do this anyway. There was no choice. Things were shut down. And so it made us stop. But I'm afraid in a lot of ways, we're like addicts who just want more of what we had before. And we can't wait to get back to the way that things were before that. And, and think about how many things we did before COVID that weren't really necessary. We just did them because we did them and our schedules were full of all these things. And I don't know if we, maybe, maybe I should just speak for myself. I don't know that I learned a lot from that experience. What we really need is to hear the words of Jesus. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But sometimes it doesn't feel like that. So the question is, what is going on? Why doesn't it feel like that for me sometimes? Why doesn't it feel like that for you sometimes? And what we really need is, is Sabbath. That's what Jesus, I think, would tell us. What we need in the midst of this busyness is Sabbath. And we need Sabbath, but I'm not sure really know, we really know how to find that. And so we come to church, and that's part of it. But how do we find real, continual, intentional Sabbath on a regular basis? A lot of times I think our solution in terms of finding Sabbath in the midst of this busyness is like bringing a cup of water to a big fire. So I have a confession for you this morning, something that is not, was not on my resume as the search committee gets really nervous. I have burned a church van down to the ground, 100% down to the ground. Let me tell you the story. When I was a youth minister, we had a great youth ministry, but I didn't have very many volunteers to be van drivers. So before church on Wednesday night and after church on Wednesday night, and before church on Sunday evening and after church on Sunday evening, I would go pick up kids and then I would take them home after church in the church van. And so it was, I think, a Sunday afternoon and I had just dropped the last kid off. I was on this farm to market road headed back to the church and then to drop off the van and to get my truck and then to go home. And about two or three miles away from the church, a deer ran out in front of me. And I was on a farm to market road with no shoulders, nothing else, and so I just, I hit it about 65 miles an hour. <clears throat> I don't think the deer made it. I, don't, I didn't confirm that part of the story. But I was on this farm to market road with no shoulders, and there's ditches on both sides of the road. There is nowhere for me to pull off and check the damage and see how things are going. And so <clears throat> I think, well, I think up ahead I can, I can pull over there, and so I just start to slow down and I'm looking at this place up there where I'm going to pull off the side of the road and as I'm looking off up into the distance where I'm going to pull off and trying to kind of collect my nerves a little bit and kind of looking back to see what happened to the poor deer I notice that there's flames coming up from under the dashboard and there's still nowhere for me to pull off and this is a problem and so I finally get up there to where I can pull off of the road, and by the time I pull off of the farm-to-market road where there's not a ditch anymore, there are flames coming from under the dashboard. There are flames coming from under the hood. The, 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 uh, the dashboard is beginning to melt. It's not the kind of place I wanted to be. So I hopped out of the van. I grabbed my phone, and... <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever been in a car where this has happened before, but your first thought, whether you have any, your first thought is, this thing is going to blow up. I got to get out of here. So that was my first thought. So I grabbed my phone, I put it in park, I pulled off on the side of the road, and I ran, I don't know, a few hundred yards down the road. And so I get a few hundred yards down the road, and we live in this very rural area where if you call 911, your call has to be routed about six times before it actually gets to the place where you're going, where you need it to go. And so I call my father-in-law. He's my pastor and the pastor of the church where I was serving. 
And uh, I called, and he would know the number to the fire department, so I called him up, and I, I should have told this story last week when he was here, by the way. I called him up, and I said, David, <clears throat> the van is on fire. And he said, what? And I said, yeah, it's on fire. So he, I hung up. He said he was going to call the fire department, and then he said he was going to come down there. Now, what I said was what? The van is on what? Fire. What David heard was, the van is overheating. So about two and a half minutes later, I see David in his Lincoln flying over the hill like the Dukes of Hazard, and he gets down there, and as he comes over the hill, he tells me later that it looked like a bonfire around the van. But to be helpful, because he thought the van was overheating, he brought a cup of water to cool down the engine. And I'm afraid sometimes in our busyness, in our life of going constantly, in our life of agreeing to everything, that it becomes a fire that we then try to put out with a little bitty cup of water. Jesus tells us in Mark chapter 2 that Sabbath is a gift. That Sabbath is a gift for us that God gives to us. Sometimes we need to be reminded that things go on without us. Sometimes we think a little bit too highly of ourselves and we think, well, if I'm not involved in that or if I don't do that or, or if I'm not at the head of that, then that's just, it's not going to work. Whether that's at work or church or somewhere else. And certainly there are things that we're, we, we might feel gifted in. Sometimes we give ourselves a little bit too much credit and don't give not God enough credit. Without Sabbath, we burn out, we flare out, we brown out, we end up, we end up with nothing left to spare. If we were to drive to St. Louis today and we would go through downtown and across the river into Illinois, we could look down at the Mississippi River and we could see, of course, how wide it is. We could see that it might be moving quickly, but we really don't sense the power of something like the Mississippi River until we go down to the level of the river and we get out of our car and we walk out onto the levee and we look at how powerful and how quick and how swift and how massive something like that river really is. And if I take a little raft and I put it out on the river and I, I go down the river several miles and then I get off of the river, my raft didn't make the river go, did it? The river made my raft go. The river was there long before I ever got on the river and the river will be there a long time after I was off of it. None of us make it go and sometimes... Sometimes we tend to think that we make the kingdom of God go, but we don't. It was here before us. It's eternal. We're invited to be a part of it, but we don't make it go. Sometimes we also need a reminder that, well, things really just aren't that bad for us sometimes. One of my favorite songwriters that died last year right at the beginning of COVID has this line in a song that says it's a half an inch of water and you think you're going to drown. <laughs> Sometimes we approach life like that. We make our little problems into huge problems. Things often aren't as bad as they seem and sometimes we simply need to take a breath and to step away from things. Our model over and over and over again in terms of rhythm of life and rhythm of work and rest is Jesus we see Jesus over and over again in this rhythm of life and rest, this rhythm of work and Sabbath, where he would take and he would rest and find silence and find solitude to prepare for a major task or to recharge after hard work or to work through his own grief or before he had to make an important decision or in a time of distress or to focus on prayer. Our model is Jesus and Jesus was intentional about these times. He was intentional about finding time and finding space where he could be with the Father in quiet, in solitude, in moments of Sabbath. And we need to be intentional about those same things, about finding those moments of silence and solitude and those moments of, of worship. Nobody, nobody is going to prioritize your health for you. 
Nobody's going to do it. Your doctor is not going to prioritize your health for you. Your family can't even really prioritize your health for you. Your friends can't do that. I can't do that. Nobody is going to prioritize your own health. That's something that we have to do for ourselves. And so we have to prioritize our own health. We have to prioritize our own spiritual growth. We have to priori prioritize our own rhythm of work and rest, of finding Sabbath. We have to prioritize that, be intentional about that, or guess what? It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen if we're not intentional about it. And so we have to work hard to find balance and find rhythm we have to work hard to, to clear these spots in our lives where we find this Sabbath. God calls us to work. He calls us to a task. He calls us to work hard. He calls us to use our gifts and our calling and to lean into that. But he also gives us Sabbath and rest. And those things work together. And Jesus had this intentional rhythm of work and rest, of getting after it and finding Sabbath. And we see Jesus prioritize things like prayer, don't we? And so he would go off and he would find a, a nice, quiet place, the scripture tells us, and he would spend time with the Father in prayer. Or he would take and get away, not just from the crowd of thousands, he would even get away. <laughs> he would even get away from the crowd of 12. And I mean, can you really blame him? They seem to argue about some silly things sometimes. But he would get away even from that group of 12 disciples and he would take two or three and he would spend time with them in a smaller group, recharging, reinvigorating, finding Sabbath, and being reinvigorated again for the work that he was called to. And if all of those things are important for the God of the universe, how important are they for us? If those things are important for Jesus Christ the Lord, how much more important are they for me and for you? And so we have to find those moments of Sabbath. It might be Sunday for you. It's not for me. <laughs> but it might be Sunday for you. It, but it's not about a certain day, and that's what Jesus makes very clear in Scripture. But it is about us being consistent and being intentional and finding a day, finding that day and guarding it, or finding that moment and that time where it is Sabbath and refreshment for you and guarding it. Some of you own a copy of the Message Bible that Eugene Peterson translated, the paraphrase. Eugene Peterson pastored primarily one church for an extended period of time for several years. And he told his church family that I will be there when you need me to be there, but that one day, that one day per week, and I can't remember what day it was for him and his family, that one day per week, that is my Sabbath. And without that Sabbath, I'm not going to be able to serve you well. And so he, 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 he picked it and he guarded it. Over and over. Is my mic cut off? Okay. Is it still off? Okay. So these Sabbath moments, we have to find them. We have to be intentional about them. We have to guard them. It's not just my job as a pastor to find those moments and guard them. It's your job as disciples of Jesus to find those moments and to guard them, to find those moments and those days of Sabbath because in those moments and days of Sabbath, that is where we find refreshment. That is where we find that we're reinvigorated for the work of God. Last thing, and then I'm going to close. Left to our own devices, we, we tend to make a mess of this. Anybody ever made a mess of something before? I, I have. Left completely and totally to our own devices, we make a mess of this kind of thing. We really do. I mean, you just think about technology, right? I can reach into my back pocket, and I've got my iPhone, and you know what? It might be cracked a little bit, and it might not be the newest version, but I can pretty much do anything I want to do on here. I've got more apps than I know what to do with. I can pull up information at my fingertips. Do you remember when mobile phones first became a thing? I remember writing with my grandpa who had a bag phone. Y'all remember the bag phone? 
Then they had the brick phone, right? You had to take two people and you had to have a third come and help hold that thing up by your ear. It was so big. And then we went, of course, to the flip phones and now we have this incredible technology right here in our pocket. But do you remember the things that were said when those were first developed? This will make life what? Easier. Do any of us think at this point in 2021 with all of our technology that any of it really makes life easier? No, it doesn't. In fact, in a lot of ways, it makes life harder because I carry with me now the capacity to work at any point, at any place, at any time. You see, left to our own devices, we make a really big mess of this. We need Jesus to show us the way. We need Jesus to show us the way to find Sabbath and to find rest in the midst of this busyness, in the midst of this constant yes, in the midst of a culture that is one side hustle after another. You remember the story of Jesus and the woman at the well from John chapter 4? It's, of course, the middle of the day, and Jesus is sitting by the well while the disciples have gone into town. And the woman comes to the well, and she asks Jesus for what? A drink of water. All she asked for was a drink of water, and Jesus offered her rivers of living water. If we can find and we can protect, and we can guard, and we can intentionally find Sabbath in our lives. Sabbath for us in a busy world and in the midst of a busy life is like living water, quenching a dumpster fire of busyness that we continually bring one little bitty cup after another to the fire and try to put it out, and we can't do it. But Jesus offers us rivers, of living water. Would you stand? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes and let's pray together before we sing our song of invitation and response this morning. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to encourage you to let the words of Jesus speak to you. Maybe he's teaching you and calling you even in this moment to be intentional about finding those spaces of Sabbath. Maybe he's teaching you and calling you and, and showing you that you've said yes to so much that you, that you can't do anything. Maybe he's teaching you in this very moment what it means to really love you and to offer you rest in the midst of busyness and pressure. God, we thank you for these words of Jesus and for the love and for the life of Jesus. Lord, we pray that we would be intentional about finding Sabbath, about spending time in quiet, in worship, in prayer that we would be refreshed and recharged for the work that you have called each of us to, whether that be in church or in our everyday life, that we would do it well because we first found Sabbath in the midst of that busyness. We can't do it on our own, God. On our own, we'll make a mess of it. We need your help. Help us to do this. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Just one quick reminder. I want to remind you that on Wednesday nights, everything is started again for us. So children's ministry, youth ministry, and of course, our Wednesday night Bible study are all going on. And all of those start at 6 o'clock on Wednesday. So we'd love for you to join in uh, with us and what God is doing in our midweek as well. All right, let's sing one more time and we'll be finished up for this morning. 